So this is a new part. This is part two, simulation and analysis. And so the objective, objectives for this part of this part, chapter six, is to uh, first we're going to start out with the grid approximation, see how that works. That's just kind of like a baby step to like how you might do some numerical techniques. Uh, there's a lot of limitations to that. And you probably never really use it much beyond that. And then look at exploring Monte Carlo Markov chain. Next chapter is going to be when they discuss how it kind of works behind the hood. They're not going to really talk about the real secret sauce of, of uh, our stand because Stan uses her her Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or something. And it's, I don't know, I've never understood it myself. So they're not going to talk about that, but they're going to talk about the basic idea of how the Metropolis Hastings algorithm works, which is cool. Mm -hmm. It's good to know, right? Yeah. It's enough to teach you the limitations. Anyway, that's the next chapter. And then final thing this chapter ends with is some, uh, some of the diagnostics, how to examine the results of the Mar Monte, uh, Monte Carlo, no, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Markov chain Monte Carlo. Okay, I got that right this time. Uh, let's see. So why do we need to approximate? So remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to compute this posterior, right? What we do have is a likelihood function, mm -hmm. which is the prob basically the probability of our data, but turn the arguments around, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have our prior. That's what we do have. But what we need is a posterior. And it's easy enough to write down the numerator, right? We know those two functions. We can write that down. No matter how complicated it is, we can write down the numerator. But the problem is that denominator, it gets tricky. As the number of parameters go up, uh, this denominator becomes basically intractable. And oh, here it is. You can see this is the big integral you end up having to do. And at some point, you just can't do that integral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So we need some kind of solutions. Uh, one solution is this grid approximation, which you can kind of think of just doing the integral numerically, right? Just make a grid out of all your parameters, uh, then evaluate that numerator, all those different values that would give you some kind of discrete approximation for the posterior. And then you just, now you can just normalize it by summing. So now it's not such a big deal, right? Um, so that sounds great. Grid approximation, that's a solution. But you can, and you, they give an example for doing this with a beta binomial where we already know the answer, right? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, I'm just, I have some R code here and it's copied out of the book, right? Created, I'm not gonna step through it completely, but it's here. Um, it'll be in the notes when I do the pull request, which I got to make a note trimmer to do. I also liked with the, um, so obviously I know we're going to be abandoning grid approximation, right? I, I, um, so I remember I took like a base course in undergrad. I remember they like brought up grid approximation. Like I can't really intuitively get this. I like the picture at the beginning, like with the rainbow, right? Like, Oh, in the book. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. Slice yeah. of like finer and finer chunks, right? You like, yeah. okay. Yeah. Like you're thinking about it that way makes sense, at least to me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm, for me, I'm, you know, that's interesting. That was your perspective. My perspective is I thought, oh, this is just numerical integration. I've done this before, right? You just yeah. divide up the function into grid points and evaluate them and sum it up. That's numerical integration. That, that's very bad. It's the, the easiest algorithm, but there's much better algorithms, of course. But any event, so if you do that, um, you can then normalize it, right? Because now it's just summing. That's what's happening in step three. And then you can plot that posterior. There it is, right? Uh, so this is the posterior of the beta binomial normalized. Okay, so all I, the only really difference between plotting the the just the likelihood times the prior is the fact that we normalized it, and we normalized it by taking discrete points on that numerator and summing them up, right, and dividing mm -hmm. by that. And then they do this step, which I think is kind of funny to me, is they would sample from this posterior, which you can do, right? You use a function, sa right, sample n, you give it that data, you give it the weights of the posterior, you can generate samples from that distribution in this way. Right? And then you can plot the histogram of that. But it's kind of funny, like, why would you do that? I can always just use, once I have the posterior function points, I can value anything I want with that. But I think what they're trying to do is bridge this to the sampling you're going to do in Monte Carlo Markov chain, right? So, and again, with the sample, they're trying to show with the samples, I can also compute any statistic I want once I have these samples from the uh, posterior. So that's all I really got out of that chapter. They quickly move on to the fact that, okay, this has all kinds of limitations. It's only gonna work for a few dimensions because otherwise you run into this curse of dimensionality where it, as you go up in more and more dimensions, you need more finer, finer grid. And finally, you just end up, to, it doesn't take much. I think four or five dimensions, you've already reached a point where the grid approximation becomes intractable to run on your laptop anyway. And it wouldn't make sense to like rent super, super computer time to, <laughs> to do it. Maybe a quantum computer. No, but any event. Uh, so then that's the motivation for moving on to this Monte Car Markov chain. I keep calling it the other way around. It's Markov chain Monte Carlo. 
So we can break that down, okay? What does it mean as a Markov chain? Markov chain simply means that each sample only depends on the value of the, the probability distribution of each sample only depends on the previous sample. And of course, any background definition of the system, like the data, um, what kind of model you have and everything else. But the primary thing it depends on is the previous sample. And the Monte Carlo part is that we're just, we're generating random samples from this uh, chain, that's all. That's Markov chain, Monte Carlo. And again, in the, uh, they want to remind us repeatedly, they remind us in the book that these samples are not directly from posterior and more importantly, obviously, because of the way it's defined, they're not independent, right? Each value does depend on the previous value. They're mm -hmm. not independent. So they're, but it still turns out that these samples are good representations of the posterior. And that's something we'll see why next chapter. But in this chapter, they're just going to jump into using a tool called RSTAN, which mm -hmm. is an R front end to an, a tool of a very cool library called Stan, which is isn't, it, isn't Stan like its own software? Like that's yeah, it's I mean. its own software. Exactly right. It's not even like it's not like a package. It's like literally no. its own thing. Yeah, yep. its own software. In fact, when you execute a Stan code, you need a C compiler on the back end to create the model. Business. Yeah, but uh, R Studio and R just you know takes care of all that for you. Unless something goes wrong, then you'll see some error about a compiler. Like oh what? <laughs> but. <laughs> But yeah, it's a state of the art separate tool called Stan, but R Stan is probably the most commonly used interface to it, other than, you know, I guess you can use command line Stan if you wanted to. There is Pi Stan as well. It's not as nice as R Stan. It's not as well integrated, but I'm, I'm using Pi Stan, for example, when I'm doing the exercises because I'm trying to keep my Python chops up, so to speak. Yeah. So they give an example. Oh, by the way, they get in this chapter, you go through two examples for each of these. I'm only copied in one of the examples, the beta binomial cases for both the grid and the Monte Carlo Markov chain. They also do the gamma Poisson, which I uh, didn't bother uh, going over again, because it's in the book, and I just wanted to give one example. The, it's important to look at that example in the book, because there's a, another issue in the fact that the priors on that case are on a whole, well, from zero to infinity, right? So how do you, you can't do a, you can't do a grid from zero to infinity anyway. So you have to pick some place to stop and the book talks about that a little bit, right? You just stop somewhere where there's no support in the prior essentially, right? Uh, let's see. So there's the example from the book for the Stan beta binomial, beta binomial model. And the exercises in, the, in, the, in this chapter also will have you walk through more of a how to, both the chapter and the exercises will give you more practice in writing these Stan language models. This is not R, the things in the quotes is actually Stan language. and which may sound a little bit intimidating, but when you see enough examples, you can just say, oh, I see them. You just cut and paste. Okay, it's real, bracket, lower equals zero, whatever, right? I mean, you don't need to become a master of the Stan language to do to do this stuff, but there is documentation out there, but this is probably all you're going to need to know, right? So you start, there's three sections. There's a data section. The data section just tells you what type and the limits on the data you're going to have. In this case, we have a single data variable. If you have more, you have like a Y sub 10 or Y bracket 10 or something like 10 measurements, but here we have one measurement. The parameters are the things you're fit, fitting, so to speak, right? Uh, in this case, pi or learning or whatever language you want to use and the probability. And then the model uses this language, you know, Y just is distributed as a binomial and pi is distributed as a beta distribution with these priors. So that's, that's the stand language definition of the beta binomial model for this particular case, right? The, we have the prior parameters, hyperparameters two, two glued in. We have the 10 for how many observations we took in the binomial glued in as well, or glued in, hardwired in, I guess you'd say, right? Glued, glued in. in, I like it. <laughs> and then the, then you just call Stan, you give it this string, the model, the model, you give it the data that you have in this case, only a single data point, but you have to make an R list out of it, I guess. I'm not sure. These some things in R, I'm always like, why did I make that list? I don't know, but I guess it has to be a list. Maybe because it could be others. Um, I'm not even sure I understand what a list type is in R, but compared to other it's, languages. It's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, it, it, it like borders between a dictionary and like a list in okay. Python. I, okay, that's a, a good. bit more, it's a bit more broad, I would say. Mm. Um, it's almost, it's almost like a weird thing of like a tuple list in a dictionary. It's not as like, you know, as clean as, you know, working in Python, I would say. I want to make a note to read the docs on that later. Any event, um, in this case, we're specifying four chains. So when you do the uh, uh, Monte Carlo 
Markov chain Monte Carlo. I keep saying it the wrong way around. I guess it doesn't matter which way you say it, but I'm trying to be consistent. Uh, it, you can choose how many chains you want to have. They recommend four chains here. I think everybody ends up using four chains. It's a, it's a good number of, uh, you want a few chains just so you can compare them, right? And we'll talk about that in the diagnostic section. Why not five? It's fine, whatever, but certainly not 40. Uh, iterations here, they did 10,000. They wrote it as 5,000 times two. And that reason for that is that our standard by default throws out the first half. They, burn -in, they talk about the burn-in period. I actually yeah, have done burn stuff like... I've used like these types of models, like in a paper once so that, I, I mean, I had someone do all the heavy lifting and I do remember having to like start up some, it was, it was running on a Linux machine. I don't even know what the name of the software was, but yeah, there was like this burn in period that we always had to like eliminate that data. That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry. No. And so that's exactly right. So what happens is when, a, when the thing starts out, it starts out somewhere weird in the posterior. And it takes a little while for it to hunt around a little bit and start settling, get stabilized, right? So that's called the burn-in period. And it's one of those things you have to diagnose too. And here they've used two times 5,000 because they, just to remind you that the first 5,000, you're not going to see they're thrown out. And it's only the last 5,000 that our stand's going to return to your samples. And then the seed that they use here, they always use a seed in this book, which I found out means it's supposed to be B-A-Y-E-S, right? That's the closest numbers to Bayes. Uh, oh, so the, so that's like, a, that's you know, like the calculator. You know, when we were kids, we make yeah. words in our calculators. Well, now I'm getting yeah. how old I am, but <laughs> no, I mean, hey, I did that too. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. Um, yeah, I didn't when I was first learning how to do some of this stuff. I never, I didn't understand how set seed worked, and so like, yeah, I would do all kinds of things where I would keep getting different answers, and you know, you're like, what's <laughs> going on here? So the result of this call is of the BB sim will become a stand fit object, which you can then use to extract the various samples. And I have to admit, so far I have not spent a lot of time digging into what all is in the stand fit. I've just been following the, as a cookbook what they've been doing. I think there's a lot to dig into uh, as far as what's inside that stand fit object, which I have not looked at yet. But for example, I show here how to get the chains out anyway. You can, you know, okay, here's all the four. This um, I meant to show this to you. These chains, can I still? I just realized I need to. Sh hey, I want to come up. Oh, it is up. That's why. Oh, well. Oh, but I didn't evaluate it. I'm not going to do that because it was going to, like, this Monte Carlo markup chain takes a while to run on my PC. On my Mac, it runs really fast. On my PC, it takes like a couple of minutes for some reason. I know how you feel. I, I used to use a Mac in my last job, and they um, I now have to use PCs, and it's a terrible. Yeah, to, to go terrible back. development environment. That's the problem with PC. Yeah. It's good for running uh, computer games, so. <laughs> PC it's good for as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Any event, um, you can do that when you go through the chapter. You can do. You can just all these things you can reproduce, and you should when you go through the chapter. Like the whole chapter is almost like a lab. I mean, you just like load up R, start going through, do it as they do it, and you can see that you when you load up, you look at if you evaluate uh, what the chains are, you'll see there's four, basically four columns and they're just random looking numbers right and now here's oh i do plot the trace so there's a command mmc mc, mc trace which is actually just from the bayes rule i think well i'm not sure i don't think that's i think that's a one of the libraries that comes with the book it's not a built-in thing i'm not sure about that but i think that's the case let me just check Oh, it's part of the Bayes plot package. Sorry. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen that. Is, okay, so it is. Yeah, so it's part of Bayes plot, not part of Bayes rules book, but um, and it plots out the the four chains for you. And this is part of this diagnostic. You look at the, you can say, oh, these things seem to be exploring the area pretty good, right? They're not. They're all similar. They all. Look, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but these look at this trace. See, they're all the four chains are similar. That's good. There's not a lot of. I've zoomed in quite a bit uh, of these chains. I'm only showing a hundred. I'm sorry, fifty of the 5,000 points in each chain, just so you can see, if you zoom out, you just see, looks like, you know, a big mush, but if you zoom in, you can, can see that they are correlated. Like if you look at every individual trace, you'll see that they're not each, you know, if they're down, the next one's also tends to be down. So there is some correlation there, but there's not a lot of correlation. So it's, it looks good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can also just, there's another function called MCMC density, which will plot the density And this. And I don't, I didn't, ha I didn't have time to reproduce the part of the book where they plot it on top of this, 
because we're doing the bi uh, beta binomial, you should be able to, we, we know how to do that analytically. You can plot right on top of this, the beta binomial it matches up really well. You can see that in the book chapter, but I didn't uh, reproduce that particular piece of it. But So this is the density of the sample. Notice I'm plotting the density of all the samples. Even though the samples are correlated, all the samples are well represented as coming from this distribution, but you just have to keep in mind that they are correlated. For a lot of things, it doesn't matter. If it does matter, there is, it's possible to thin out the samples. And I think as we go through the book, we'll see more and more examples of, of, of uh, more. I think like a, chapter nine in particular is when we'll start doing normal regression, simple, uh, right? And when we do that, you'll we'll see really good examples of when this, of how to use this tool better. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. Okay, so that's basically an example of Monte Carlo Markov. Markov chain Monte Carlo. I'm going to say it backwards every time. I was, I'm just going to give up on that. And so what are some of the diagnostics you can use? Well, trace plots, we just looked at trace plots, right? So you can look at the trace plot, look for good mixing, look for mixing, meaning that they're not, it's not spending a lot of time. The book gives some examples of poor mixing. For example, poor mixing case where we get stuck somewhere. The trace is, you know, uh, wiggling around and then all of a sudden just like goes to a straight line for a little bit where it gets stuck. And then it jumps to another part of the of the of the parameter space. And it jumps to another part of the parameter space, it sticks around. So that's you look at. So you just by looking at the plots, you can tell whether or not there's good mixing. Good mixing should be it should be covering a whole, uh, the parameter space. And then by comparing this, the the chains with each other, you can see it also that oh, if one's chain stuck up here, one chain stuck down here, you're not going to be fooled by oh, if it's stuck in one spot, you won't know if that it's not. Um, you won't know that it's stuck because it looks fine. Like oh, it's just that's the whole parameter. That's the uh, posterior, but no, it's actually stuck. You can see when, when you compare it to another trace, right? Mm -hmm. So those are some things you can do with the trace plots. Um, the other diagnosis you can look at is the effect of sample size and the autocorrelation. These two things are kind of related to each other. The fact that the the uh, points are, auto, are correlated with each other means that you're not, the, the samples are not independent. So if you did have independent samples, how many would you have effectively? And that's what this N effective calculates for you. Um, in fact, this N effect ratio calculates the ratio of the number of samples you actually have versus how many, or the number of effective samples divided by the total samples you actually have. So in this case, it's like 35% for that data we just had because the samples are correlated. Does that make sense? I sound like a real jumble of words, but yeah. to say yeah. it a different way is that you don't really have 5,000 good samples because they're correlated. So how many samples do you effectively have? And that's what this calculates. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, the autocorrelation function is another thing you can look at. Um, you want to see good another sign of good mixing is the autocorrelation falls off quickly. Uh, well, all this is is the correlation between pairs of mark of the of the chain values, right? Uh, that are lag steps apart. I put the word one in there. I shouldn't be there, but they're. Um, uh, so the, the very first value is zero steps, of course, then the autocorrelation will thing with sub is one, and then you go one step later, uh, the correlation, the, the value with this previous one has some uh, value that's not zero, then you go to three, the, the current, you know, one value with one three behind it and so on. The book explains it a lot better than I am, but the autocorrelation is a great tool for looking at your chains to see that they're mixing well enough or not. And they give some examples of some chains in the book that are not mixing so well where the autocorrelation doesn't fall off very fast at all. But you can see it both by looking at the traces and by looking at this autocorrelation and by looking at the N effective. All three of these things can reveal you. Know, it's good to look at all three because you want to make sure everything's uh, giving the same answers, right? Yeah. And then finally, this R hat, um, which has to do with comparing chains, right? So it's, it's the ratio of the variability in one single chain to, or I should say, the variability between other chains and to the variability inside a single chain. And they don't give you the formula for how this works, but they're, they actually give you a reference to a paper. So I guess it's not just the standard deviation or something. It must be something more complicated. But it's um, um, I'm just looking at R hat saying it's approximately equal to the square root of the variance combined over the variance within. Oh, approximately. OK. Yeah, that's how I, that's how I think of it, too. Anyway, I think about the, the you know, the variance. So the. Um, <clears throat> So the point of that is if all the chains are similar, then that should be very close to one. If some of the chains are quite are like split different, are like one chain's up here at four, another chain's like four and you know, wiggling around around four, another chain's wiggling around around one, you're gonna see a very large R hat in that case, which is very yeah. bad. In fact, they say R hat greater than 1.05 is cause for concern. They're separated at 5%. Um, 
is, is cause for concern, at least something to look at. In this case, our hat for the sim that I just did is 1.00001. So I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good for that R hat score. But that makes sense, right? It's a simple diagnostic just to determine um, that your chains are similar. You can, you can look at it by eye, but it's good, good also have a number to look at as well. So in summary, this chapter was just getting started. I, I would call it beginning started with Mark, our stand MCMC. Uh, and we learned about two uh, methods for approximating, approximating Bayesian models. One of the grid approximation, which is, it's, it's obviously very straightforward to understand what's going on, but it's very limited too. And I don't, I can't think of any cases you'd really want to use the grid approximation unless you really have like a two dimensional problem or one dimensional problem. You just have very strange Prior is you're like oh I don't it would make no sense to use markup chain Monte Carlo for that case but um, I, probably like back in the day that was probably the only way to do some of this stuff but it's based on computing um, limitations that probably, yeah yeah when you were really stuck in the, in the uh, I mean I'm trying to think of cases where you couldn't do a conjugate prior right but you only had a few parameters then yeah I think it's like yeah I think it's also like yeah you said at the beginning Ron like I think it's a good bridge. To kind of generally yeah. understanding MCMC. So at least for me, it was like, okay, I'm not going to use this, but like I Oops. kind of now get a bit more intuitively what like MCMC is like doing, even though obviously it's not like the same process as grid approximation. Yes. And, and I should say that the other, the book, the Statistical Rethinking, which is um, the other, the really great book on uh, Bayesian. Uh, data analysis, it, he also uses grid approximation as an introduction and he bridge as well in that book. And if that, so I, I think it is a good idea. Just get used to like getting numerical samples and okay, now how can we get numerical samples in a more general case? The, the main tool of choice is this uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. See, I said it in the right order. Hmm. So anyway, we learned that and we also learned some diagnostics. That was kind of the summary. Next chapter, more Monte Carlo Markov chain. Monte Carlo Markov chain under the hood, as they said. Now we have a few, oh, we have a lot of minutes. I went fast. Did I go too fast? Or just short right. chapter? I no, really I watched, I've actually been watching some like old videos from like the previous cohort and they only use like a half an hour sometimes. So, okay. This was felt like it was more of like an overview of what we're going to be like getting into. Cause I feel like chapter yeah. seven is probably going to get into like the meat of it and then the following chapters. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going to start us on um, chapter uh, seven. Yeah. Right. Just yeah. Wanna... yeah. And then I, and then I have eight um, for the week after. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll try my best to, to work in some uh, some examples for next week. But yeah, good 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 work through. Do you uh, if you guys want to spend a couple minutes, we could take a look at some of these conceptual exercises real quick yeah. just to see that um, that gives us some kind of topic, some kind of context to discuss things. Uh, I would not care about six point one. I guess we understand the grid approximation, but let's look at like six point two, right? Um, Oh, they want you to sketch by hand, but you, we can describe by words. Oh, maybe 6.3. Describe how the scenario would impact the posterior approximation. Oh, that's a good idea, right? So if the chain is mixing too slowly, what do you think the impact on the posterior approximation is going to be? Mm. And uh, by the way, A and B to me are the same. That's maybe you guys, I don't know if you guys agree, but certainly mixing too slowly and having high correlation are the same thing, right? I mean, I understand why they split those up. Like that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you have low correlation and bad? I guess you I can. Think it's... No, you can. You can. Are think. you saying A and B? You said are similar to you. Yeah. It's mixing too slowly and has high correlation. I guess you could have a low correlation and then it just gets stuck in one spot and then jumps to another spot and yeah, jumps to another spot. Like maybe it just yeah. it just takes a while for it to converge. For yeah. Whatever reason, but it could still be like not correlated. So at least like think? my interpretation is like, oh, it'll eventually mix, but like it's stuck somewhere. Yeah. So I, for me, A, I think you would see uh, the posterior look kind of lumpy. It wouldn't match obviously the real posterior, but you'd probably see uh, lumpy peaks in it because it gets stuck in one spot and gets stuck to another spot and gets stuck to another spot is my guess. Mm -hmm. and 
Yeah. What it would look like with high correlation, maybe more like, I'm not really sure. It looked wrong clearly, but I'm not sure what it looks like. <laughs> it's high correlation, like. So that's where it's kind of wandering around slow, like wandering around slowly, right? Not, not, not jump. So it's, when it's mixing well, uh, well, here, let's just look real quick. I'm right, jump. it's mixing well, it's supposed to be like, so here we go. So this A is uh, how it looks like when it's, uh, well, here's the answer, I guess. So yeah, so it's mixing slowly, then you're only getting, a, you're not getting the full spread of the, just, I get what they're saying now. In chain A, this is a mix, this is a, uh, I'm sorry, this is a high correlation situation where it's just kind of like wandering around, right? So it's just yep. wandering down. So the, it's clear, uh, not clear, but in this case, it, you're supposed to understand the idea that posterior is much wider than this, this noisy trace, but within this trace, you probably see, uh, uh, what do you say? Well, when you, do, when you look at the posterior, then you're going to see a narrow posterior because it's not exploring the whole space, I guess what they're saying. And chain B is what we talked about before when it's jumping or jumping around. When it's oh, jumping. so sorry. What's, what's filled in is the, um, is the result of that, right? The yeah. Actual, yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So you can see it's not exploring um, the whole space. It's just kind of wandering around. It's wandering around slowly. So you're only getting a piece of the wandering around. So you end up getting a misrepresentation of the posterior. Got it. And then what's the second trace B is, um, oh, this is when it gets like stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it jumps okay. Around. And, and, and it's like what you said, like it's like lumpy. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't really, it has like a few peaks. I mean, sometimes uh, it looks like B, but also when it gets, it can get, you can like get stuck somewhere else and actually be a noisy little thing somewhere else, then jump and it gets noisy somewhere else, right? Yeah. I guess this, yeah. Where was that? Oop, there we go. Uh, oh, that's C when it tends to get stuck. So if it gets stuck, it also would be lumpy as well for different, in different reasons, in my view. Yeah. yeah. Chain has no problems. In that case, you expect to see a nice, uh, noisy yeah. chain like the like this. <laughs> it's funny. Like I've seen these types of graphs or figures all my career. I mean, well, I mean, at different times, you know, when they see these, and I'm always like, "What does that even mean?" It's just a, you know, a bunch of, you know. But it's, it's actually, it's actually like now that we're talking about it. I mean, it, it is interpretable, and not in like a, you know. I mean, it's it's more of a overarching Oops. kind of vibe, you know. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean. It's not like it's not like a perfect representation of every. I mean, there's a lot more going on than just in that graph. But yeah, it's it's funny how how long I've been looking at that and not knowing what the hell it could possibly mean for decades. <laughs> you know. That's yeah, it's a little strange because like you try to be very scientific about things and then you're like, oh, let me look at these chains and like, you know, like looking at tea leaves or something and see if I can figure out if my, if my things well behaved. So it's good to also have those numerical things to back you up, right? The R hat, the autocorrelation, the effective sample number, right? right Especially when numbers. you're like, when someone asks, like they see a plot, yeah. like I feel like also stakeholders too, they're like, but what does this plot mean? It's like, well, now I actually yeah. also have a number to back it up as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like more evidence. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. The other exercise I wanted to talk through a little bit is 6.10. Uh, and this says, I, reason why I want to talk through because I just don't, I honestly am confused by this because it says, okay, below are examples of change of uh, samples. And we understand that, right? One, two, three, yep. four through N for different probability parameters, theta, right? Uh, yep. For each example, determine whether the given chain is a Markov chain. So the first one is you go out to eat n nights in a row, right? And theta a is the probability you go to eat to a Thai restaurant on day i. That doesn't seem like a Markov chain to me. It's, that seems like it's going to depend not only on whether you went to Thai yesterday or whether you went to Thai like last week might depend too, right? So that doesn't seem like a Markov chain, does it to you guys? You go to eat. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't yeah, because I feel like there are other things that it could be. It's not just dependent on like the previous value day, of right? the chain. Yeah. It's like other. Like, well, it's not like theta n minus one, right? Or whatever, right? It's like, it's, it feels like it's also- It could be, on. I guess. It could be if like, only- Oh yeah, but I feel like- If, only I, go, if only I never go to a Thai restaurant two days in a row or something, or it's very unlikely I go two days in a row, but it doesn't matter if I went to a Thai restaurant three days ago or four days ago or five days ago. Yeah. But I, that's though, not like, true, not for me. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it like could, right? Even like, yeah. um, even like right with time series, right? Like just yeah. 
auto court like you look like an ace like an autocorrelation plot and like it might like lag whatever but let's say like seven right i'd still right. be like autocorrelated um, so i don't think that's a, i wouldn't say that's a mark off chain and then b says you play the lottery n days in a row and theta i is probably you win the lottery in day i um i mean probably you win the, the lottery on day i well, obviously, lottery is completely independent from day to day, so that can't be a market. Well, actually, that's not quite true. You could you could say it's like a degenerate market off chain. It just doesn't depend at all on any previous days. I mean, independent samples are still a market off chain, and I guess in a degenerate sense, and then it depends on the previous value, but that dependence is it doesn't matter, maybe. But that's all I get out of that one. What do you guys think about that? I just, I just like that we can call models degenerates. Let's see. <laughs> well, I, that's not probably the correct technical term. No, no, no. no we're, we're only calling bad models degenerates. From degenerates. Now. Actually, that's, that, I think that's way better. So, it sounds better than just calling it bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then C is like you play your roommate chess for end games in a row, and theta i is probably you win game i. Again, it would depend, it might depend on previous winning because you learned, I would but... say that is more of a Markov chain than any of the others because yeah. I feel like if um you play roommate okay in end games and theta i is the probability you win game i against your roommate like maybe it, depending on what happened in the previous game that might influence right yeah the next one like i could see that like maybe you lose like maybe maybe you're more likely right to lose like the next game or if you won maybe like you're you know i could see that there's more of like a dependence there but i, I guess my point of this whole exercise is none of these things are clear-cut markov chains why didn't they give like a good example of a markov chain in this thing i mean it's like they're all poor <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like, or or we're just like overthinking it, but like, no, I, I agree. Uh, it's maybe like, that's the case. But that's many, yeah, I, yeah, they're not as clear as like that is definitely a Markov chain, or you know, yeah. All right, well, that's basically all I had for. Uh, yeah, no, it's good. Good today. start. I'll um, I'll, I'll um, I hope that was clear enough. For you guys. Oh, know. oh yeah. I definitely just need to go through the example. Like need it again. Yes. Go through I the examples. Encourage, for encourage sure. you to do that. Um, and it's also with chapter five, too. If you haven't done those exercises, I encourage you to do yeah. those as well. I found that when I did those, there's some things I thought I understood that I didn't understand. Um, uh, especially like with respect to the normal normal or to the gamma Poisson um one, for example. I'm like, oh, it's not just the the likelihood is not a single Poisson, it's this product of Poissons, which is not a Poisson anymore, it's some other thing. And yeah. Well, I guess it's a gamma, but um, yeah. yeah. Made more sense to me when I started working through, I'm like, oh, I see what I have to write down now. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. This is actually great. I can actually eat lunch before my next meeting. I appreciate Yay. it. Yay. Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will, uh, right. I, will, I will talk to you guys uh, hope, and hopefully Rachel maybe next week. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've got, did you already put your name in on the thingy? Yep. Um, I am yep. uh, I am locked down for this chapter right. seven. And I'm very grateful eight. to both of you for signing up for those. And uh... <laughs> no, of course, this has been fun. Even like when yeah. I did chapter five the other week, I'm like, oh, I actually like learned a lot more. <laughs> and you know, yeah. you're like talking about it, like figure out where you, Absolutely. I had no idea what I was talking about or not, not yeah. no idea what I was talking about, like things I'm like a bit unsure, you know, yeah. things I've been unsure about. Um, so yeah. Cool. All right, guys. See you Thank next you. week. See you guys next week. Bye.